Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for Sunday, May 17th. Uh, I'm a ruling elder, Zach Cosner. Uh, I ask you that you uh, download a copy of today's bulletin that can be found at our website, www.centralprespb.com. Uh, it can be found at the publications link at the top of the webpage. Um, you can also find it in the description under this video on uh, YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, having said that, I ask you that you turn now your attention to the announcements found on the back of that bulletin. Central's session has postponed in-person worship through the end of May. A decision about future in-person worship will be made at that time. Follow us on social media or check out our website, www.centralprespb.com, for more information. Uh, this uh, Yesterday, I spoke with the head of the uh, Presbytery of Arkansas Youth Ministries. Uh, she let me know that there are still openings available for the Junior High Jubilee at Moe Ranch in Texas and the Montreat Youth Celebration for senior high students in Montreat, North Carolina. Uh, they are offered, those trips are offered by the Presbytery of Arkansas. They have extended their deadlines for registration. Both trips have a few openings left. Uh, if you're worried about losing your deposits or your registration fees, uh, she wanted me to make sure that everyone knew that they are holding on to those registration fees at the Presbytery of Arkansas office and will return those uh, upon the cancellation of those two trips. So if they, if you sign up and they cancel the trips, they will return your, uh, your registration fees. Uh, if you have an interested youth, uh, please contact me uh, or the church office through th our social media uh, channels. Ferncliff Camp and Conference Center in Little Rock is asking for your recipes for a cookbook fundraiser. Check out their Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash ferncliffcamp for more information about their fundraiser. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and on YouTube. Links to each are on our website, uh, centralprespb.com. Uh, speaking of our website, our uh, online giving, again, is now available. Uh, click the Donate Now link at the top of the webpage, and we take credit cards, debit cards, and checks, and you can also set up recurring donations on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. In life, in death, in life beyond death, Jesus Christ is Lord. Over powers and principalities, over all who determine, control, govern, or finance the affairs of humankind, Jesus Christ is Lord. Of the poor, of the broken, of the sinned against, and the sinner, Jesus Christ is Lord. Above the church, beyond our most excellent theologies, and in the quiet corners of our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please join me in the call to confession. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let us admit our sins before God and one another, first using the prayer printed in your bulletin and then silently. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from, uh, from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ, your Son. And now silently... Amen. As people born of the water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. To
We're going to cut this out. Hold on a minute. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the, with the Jews and with the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic, uh, Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a, pro a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and they brought him to the Aparagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that we... Let me try this again. Today's first scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. Please listen for the word of the Lord. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of the foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Aparagus and asked him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and foreign living, foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling our, or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Aparagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What, therefore, you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath in all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has a fixed day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and came, became believers, including Dysonius, the Arabite, and the woman named Demarius, and others with them. Today's section, second scripture reading is uh, from the book of 
1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even after you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for good conduct in good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to uh, suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons were saved through water. And baptism, which is prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Open our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, in hearing we might believe, and in believing we might live lives richer and fuller in service to you, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with a gentleness and reverence. So exhorts Peter. And in those words, we find some wonderful advice on evangelism. I'll acknowledge that this is not a very popular word among most Presbyterians. And that is due in large part, I believe, to how evangelism has been portrayed. Evangelism in its purest form means to herald the good news. But that concept has morphed into a little more than scaring the people with the prospect of burning in hell on one hand or offering them nothing but entertainment on the other. Why? The answer is that somewhere along the way, evangelism became synonymous with church growth. It became less about telling others the good news and more about padding our membership roles. In subtle and not so subtle ways, the emphasis shifted from telling a sinful and broken world about what God has done to an idolatry of self, in which the whole purpose of reaching out was to make the church larger, wealthier, and more prestigious. Note, however, that Peter does not argue that faith is a club with which we are able to, which we are to beat each other's. Note, however, that Peter does not argue that faith is a club with which we are to beat others into submission. Within these verses, there is no threat of the eternal fires of hell, no admonition to turn or burn. Neither is faith portrayed as a guarantee of, li of a life of ease and prosperity. Instead, these verses form part of Peter's discussion about what to do when believers are subjected to suffering for doing right. Like Jesus himself, Peter is fully aware that the faithless to faithfulness to Christ is more likely to bring about persecution than praise. At such time, the believer should be ready to proclaim why he or she has a reason to hope. And lest they forget that reason, he reminds his readers, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. Our reason for hope is that in Jesus Christ we have been brought to God. We are no longer estranged, but reconciled. We are no longer strangers, but children of God. We are no longer separated, but intimately joined. We are no longer lost, but found. This is the reason to celebrate, even when the believer endures suffering. Of course, we all need to be reminded of great, this great truth at times, 
because sometimes we get so caught up in what is happening to us that we cannot see the forest for the trees. Such was also the case for the people of Athens, whom Paul encountered. As this morning's reading from Acts opens, we find Paul waiting in Athens for Silas and Timothy to join him before they continue their missionary journey. While in Athens, however, Paul becomes deeply distressed to see the city full of idols. In Greek, the words translated full of idols conjures up the image of a forest of idols. By so arguing in the synagogue and the marketplace, Paul was seemingly trying to point out that God was indeed near to the people, but that they could not recognize God in the midst of so many idols. His words and actions caught the attention of some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who initial, whose initial impression of Paul was less than flattering. They called him a babbler, which in Greek is literally seed picker, someone who simply rehashes old ideas that are no longer relevant or important. Others accused him of proclaiming foreign divinities. Says one commentator, Paul's place in the marketplace of idea, ideas <clears throat> has been challenged in the two ways most damning of the ancient philosopher. He is an incompetent seed picker who traffics in strange religion. So Paul is invited to address the Areopagus, a sort of city assembly or council that would hear public debates and render verdicts. This would be no easy task. Epicureans were materialists and believed that human life exists by nat natural chance. Avoidance of pain and suffering is the true aim of this life and not religious devotion. Since a personal providential God, a God who can make a practical difference in the outcome of a happy life, simply does not exist. One could see that they would therefore be less than opening to hearing about a Messiah who suffered for others. Significantly, Epicureans were harsh criti critics of idolatry as well. Their primary criticism of Athenian folk religion was that offering sacrifices to God who are neither personal nor providential may be religious, but it is also irrational. Impersonal deities cannot produce personal happiness. Stoics, on the other hand, were hard rationalists, guided by their analytical observation and careful reasoning. They sought to live in harmony with the cosmos. Stoics believed in the solidarity of the human race and in the deity in whom we live and move and have our being. Because conversely, the deity is in all things, not transcendent, as is the most high God. In other words, the audience Paul faced would have either opposed him because he did not believe in a God who is intimately involved with creation, or would have said such a God who would send a savior would be unnecessary because God already existed in everything. As he stood before those gathered, Paul began to speak. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. In essence, they were close to the secret of life, but in spite of all their efforts, their urge to find God had not been satisfied and could not be satisfied with the images made of marble and stone. They had looked everywhere, turned over every stone, and had still not found the living God. Notice the method of Paul's evangelism. Like the evangelism urged by Peter, there is no single sentence or phrase that has in it anything of harshness. It seems apparent that he did not demand that they jump to his assumptions about life and truth, but started where they were. Maybe he gave his hearers the benefit of the doubt, pictured them as earnest seekers of God, and saw their previous misguided attempts as forgivable instances of ignorance. From beginning to end, there was nothing calculated to offend. But let me be clear. One does not need to calculate to offend when telling the good news because the good news is offensive enough. On one hand, to proclaim the message of a savior means that we all must come to terms with our own sinful, broken lives, and thus our need for a savior. On the other hand, the message of a crucified and risen Messiah was a scandal to Jews and a stumbling block to Greeks. Paul recognized their religious hunger. Every idol, every temple indicated their need for God. 
The trouble from Paul's standpoint was that people of Athens had been searching in all the wrong places. They had looked everywhere, but had not found God. The good news that Paul offer, however, is that God is closer than they might think, that there is a reason to hope. Paul cut through the basic matter of what they believed and what they aspired to and what they actually needed. In his speech before those who had gathered, he articulated the beliefs that he had held in common with them and the beliefs that differed from theirs. He asserted that his belief in the, the God who is Lord of heaven and earth, who gives life and breath and all good things. He asserted his belief in a God who from one ancestor made all nations. He asserted his belief in a transcendent God who nevertheless drew near and suffered on the behalf of a sinful humanity. In celebrating this God, Paul even borrowed words from their own poets when he said, For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, we, For we too are his offspring. He offers reason to hope by proclaiming the gracious work of God in Jesus Christ. It was evangelism in its truest form. Some might view Paul's efforts as a failure, because some scoffed and others remained unconvinced. But the true measure of the Christian is not in numerical success. Rather, it is remaining faithful to God in both trying and triumphant times. That, I think, is the message for us today. After all, things are not all that different today than they were in Paul's day. Ours, too, is a golden age full of computers and space travel and medical advances the world would have never dreamed of, not to mention engineering feats it never believed possible. And, like the Athenians then, many are still looking for ultimate value for God. We try pleasure-seeking or drugs or business or family, always looking, looking, looking for what will satisfy the God-shaped hole in our hearts, but always coming up empty because we look in all the wrong places. If we listen closely to our culture, we would likely discover this longing for God just beneath the surface. It is evident in the things people say like, life doesn't add up to anything, or I don't really mean anything to anybody, or I wish I could be sure of something. Start talking with people about the widespread feeling of the meaninglessness of existence, the de depersonalization of our lives, the abyss of insecurity that undermines our certainty, the demonic in human affairs, and the ambiguities of ethical behavior, and right away you will have an audience. You will be talking about them, reading their sor secret sorrow, probing their pain and confusion, and in the process, opening wells of, op of understanding. And into that despair and brokenness, we are called to give an accounting for the hope that is in us. Our reason to hope is that God is not far from any of us. We need not look in faraway places for the joy and peace of life. It is here and it is now. It is in God in whom we live and move and have our being. Some may scoff at our message. Some may not be able to see the forest for the trees. Some may indeed believe the good news. Regardless of the response, our call to give an accounting for the hope that is in us remains constant as constant as the love of the one who is the source of all hope. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Uh, please join me now and let us return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings using the Donate Now link found at the top of our webpage, www.centralprespb.com. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, for, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our, uh, and in, uh, our treasures, and indeed our very, our very selves for you to see fit, to use as you see fit. And until that most glorious day, when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let's please share our joys and concerns. Um, I was asked um, in our, uh, uh, let's see, in our uh, Facebook messenger group, that we uh, hold Bernice Lackey in our prayers, uh, Linda Minyard in our prayers, and Brad Von Tunglin in our prayers. All three of them are dealing with um, various uh, medical issues. Uh, we continue to hold all three in our prayers today. Uh, we also want to continue to hold uh, all of those people who are uh, reopening their businesses and going out to those businesses um, uh, reopening parts of our uh, economy. Uh, we pray for them as, and pray that they do not uh, get sick. Uh, we pray that we uh, do not um, overburden our first responders, um, our nurses, our doctors, our uh, those who are not able to um, quarantine themselves in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, we ask that those who are um, infected with the virus, uh, receive a speedy recovery. And uh, we uh, pray for all of those people who are affected by, who law, have lost family members or who are personally affected by coronavirus. Um, uh, we pray for them and we ask that they have um, comfort during these uh, stressful and, and, and worrisome times. Uh, we also have a joy, some uh, multiple joys uh, to announce. Uh, we want to take a moment to um, congratulate our graduating senior uh, high school seniors in the class of 2020. Um, we are very, very proud of all of you. Um, uh, our graduating seniors are uh, Lindsey Sanchez, uh, Weston and Logan Mosley, and Cody Vick. Again, um, the church are, is very proud of all of you and, and how you guys have uh, handled yourselves and how well you've uh, handled um, all of the um, problems that the coronavirus pandemic uh, thrust upon you uh, during your senior years. And we know that this will uh, only strengthen you uh, and your endeavors going forward. And uh, again, uh, all of our best to you four. Uh, we, um, we will be praying for you and your future uh, endeavors going uh, in, in. And thank you. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Please be with those seniors as they graduate high school that we mentioned, Cody, Lindsay, Weston, and Logan. Uh, please be with them in their future endeavors. Um, please be with those who are affected directly and indirectly by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, please protect, protect those who are re-entering into the public space. Uh, please be with our first responders and our medical professionals. Uh, please keep them safe. And please comfort those who have lost, lost loved ones in, the, in, the, in these past days. Uh, know, let them know that you were there with them and that you grieve their losses <clears throat> during this horrible, horrible time. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit. Taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you for all now and forevermore. Amen.